with Hakeem Olajuwon, like before this book, in terms of his presence, because I'm always interested with international players specifically, like how much of an influence in terms of like your, since everybody's hoop heads, anybody who's interested in basketball has like their top 10. So in terms right. of Hakeem Olajuwon, like where was he in terms of your list of players where you're always fascinated by him or was he kind of off the radar of like the players that you grew up watching? I think he was definitely in my radar in the sense of somebody that I found really interesting, but I, I was almost too young to appreciate it because he, his first title 94, I was born in 91. So what I know of him is nostalgia. What I know of him is old clips. And I think that experience is unfortunately pretty common for people in their early thirties or just under. And so I was always fascinated with him. I the broad strokes of his story, you know, like I was very interested in his connection to Islam and things like that. But the more I thought about it, I was like, why is he just left out of these all time discussions? That's what really piqued the curiosity is how come like he's forgotten? This pioneer seems to be forgotten. Yeah, especially when you pair that with, I think statistically, a lot of people know and recognize that he is arguably the greatest defender in NBA history. I mean, there are other people in that argument as well, certainly, but it seems like he does get in some ways recognition for that, but then is kind of left off, you know, a lot of people's like top 10 lists and, and things like that, that are maybe sort of the bigger scale conversation points. Exactly. And, you know, for him to be top 10 in steals at his size is absurd. Like he just, yes. <laughs> like you should not be able to do, it. but I think for the, the fans, I don't want to use the term casuals, but for people that aren't in the know, yes, like they may not know him, but to see the reverence that current generations, past generations of players have for him, I'm like, okay, we need to bridge the gap between how, you know, these, these current NBA players, they seek his services, his mentorship, but how can the average person who loves basketball come to know his story? That That's what really piqued my curiosity. Awesome. And how big of a presence did you find there was in, in terms of his impact on the sport in like doing your research for this book and in all the interviews and everything that you conducted? Huge. Um, I, he, you know, when people say worldwide, they're, they're kind of like not serious, but he, he really is. He is beloved worldwide people in Amman, Jordan, where he lived for a long period of time, love him. He lived in Birmingham uh, in the UK for a while. They love him. And, you know, in Houston, he is almost this mythical figure and yet, just this average person you can see on the sidelines at AAU games, or you see him at a different mosque every Friday. So the fun part of this research was everybody has a Hakeem story. One time my car broke down and Hakeem happened to be there. And wow, it was crazy. <laughs> he was so nice. And oh, one time I was praying next to him and he said hi to my mom or, you know, it's just, everybody has a story. And so it was just really fun, like seeing that impact because when you're doing a biography, it's not just like, what did this person achieve on the floor? What awards did they win? How amazing were they at their sport? It's like, what what kind of impact did you have on various communities? And that is like so key to his story. Can you go over his impact in terms of the, the international game and how that's affected the NBA? Because I don't think that's talked about enough. I think his, his impact's discussed, but not so much in terms of how he has affected the game internationally. And now what we're seeing with all these players come from different countries and making a huge impact. So, and specifically Africa as well. And others, you know, fall in his footsteps, such as Luau Dang and uh, the, the Timbe Matumbo, who unfortunately passed away recently. Oh so God. can you just discuss kind of him being a pioneer, not only internationally, but specifically Africa as well? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I'm so like happy that you brought that up because that was a huge part of also my motivation for the project was seeing, you know, the Giannis's and the Joel Embiid's of the world and seeing how, you know, these players that are of African descent are really dominating our league, but nobody really talks about who paved the way for them. And so I wanted this book to like almost give Hakeem his flowers in basically connecting those that, hey, the legacy that you had, it inspired these generations of African players to not only believe that they could play in the NBA one day, but to really inspire the NBA itself to build the infrastructure necessary within so many different countries in Africa to have this pipeline to be seen and recruited, right? Like Hakeem comes to America almost by accident. Like there's no path that doesn't exist back then. Um, and now there's academies, there's all these things. And, you know, this book really traces back that to Hakeem. And like you mentioned, like Matumbo, my God, like the role that he played in that 
Herculean, but there were so many people that played a role and Hakeem was one of them as, as really like the true ambassador. Yeah. I mean, what, what a blessing in some ways to have a league where, you know, the big man at the time is kind of the, the paramount icon of the sport. You know, you have several bigs over the years, Kareem, of course, and several others in that era that Elijah played in and you happen to get arguably the best one to ever do it, certainly on the defensive side, come from Africa. Is there still a, a continuing connection? I'm, I'm sure there is with Africa. And, and what does that look like um, if, if you have knowledge from the research that you've done? Yeah, I would call him, um, you know, an unofficial ambassador in many ways. He does things in private to show up to, a, you know, to events if he's not there, funding, charity work, all of these things to fund. Um, and he's definitely somebody that it's interesting, the, the people that work the NBA academies throughout Africa, they always mention his name. And I love that they are telling the story of Hakeem because they're not just learning about MB, they're learning about who was the first. They're learning that history. So I, I think that's super interesting. And I think the flashpoint of, of Hakeem's service was the 2015 um, Africa game in Johannesburg. And it's a lovely scene. It's in, near the end of the book. Um, and it kind of brings it to the present with Giannis. Um, Hakeem holds workouts at like 6 a.m. <laughs> who shows up? Of course, Giannis, Mr. Work Ethic. I'm taking a note out of Dream's book. Um, and yeah, I think his in, his involvement in those games was huge. And Dikembe was there also. Can you discuss, since you you know you're very aware of the international landscape, I remember discussing with you this with you earlier on um, with our last interview. And I think present day NBA, you take a look at this the top ten players currently going on now. The majority of them are not from the United States. So with your best insight, can you point to? Which countries should like your casual fans be paying attention to in terms of those players dominating the league in the next few years, in your opinion? Well, it, that's such a good question. It's interesting because immediately my first thought was in Africa. But then, of course, when I think of Wemby and, and the French connection, I think of, you know, there are so many great players coming out of France right now. It's unbelievable. It, it seems like a pipeline. So I think that would be my first thought. My second thought, though, is Senegal because the NBA Academy is there. And the training that those players are receiving is incredible. They are not just learning basketball and, and how, you know, how to prepare for the next level and all of that and what it takes to train to be a professional athlete, but just like having the example of now there being a professional league in Africa as well, like the up and comers that are coming out of these academies, it's just going, they're going to dominate the NBA for a while. A lot of the NBA um, international officials who are really deep in this work have basically said, you know, we're at this like tipping point and, and everything is, is changing right now. I want to go back to Elijah Juan and you mentioned like the work he did with Giannis and there's just, it seems like always at least a handful of people you hear about that are going to work with Elijah Juan on footwork in the post, among other things. Is it, I don't know how to frame this question, but it seems like Elijah Juan is the go-to to work with in the post. I mean, is, is this a reflection of the post game dying out a bit since Elijah Juan left. We know about the modern changes of the game, of course, with the three point shot and everything and, and more focus there. But I guess why is it that, that Elijah Juan is, is constantly that guy that you hear about and doing post footwork training for these guys? Yeah. It's so interesting, right? Because he came in the modern era while I'm sure he would dominate, it's and he was the most well equipped for today's game the big men being the center of everything is obviously a foregone era and the fact that they think of him really speaks to the fact that they never saw him as a center i think a lot of these players see him as a guard and the fact that kobe thought wow i can learn how to post up from somebody that's kind of like me i can see myself in him was fascinating to me you know, being in LA growing up here, I would always see Kobe like backing down, you know, his signature, like, okay, I'm going to back him down. Then I'm going to do the elbow. And, you know, I, I just never thought like, oh, Hakeem until this project. And I was like, duh, that's where he got it, you know? And so I think they see, they see quickness and quickness is evergreen in the NBA. Um, and Hakeem is the only like 
person I, I can think of with that nimbleness, if that's a word, that agility, that creativity. And like, you have to have that to survive in the game. I also think it's amazing considering that Hakeem is not on TV, like Kenny Smith and Charles Barkley and Shaq. And yet these players continue to seek him out. So it just shows like if fans don't know his legacy, the players know, and they always come to him. And why, why is that, that Hakeem isn't maybe a little bit more present in, you know, the mainstream or in media? Is that kind of personal choice or do you think there may be other reasons around that? Definitely personal choice. And it, um, it pretty much goes back to his faith, his religion. So much of it is about, um, being humble and uh, giving and charity and secret and, you know, not being boastful and not being, you know, the center of attention. And, you know, he really is like a very, very, very private person. And I think that that is something I really admire because all of his contemporaries went into broadcasting <laughs> or coaching and there is this, and they're all great at it. So this is not, a, this is not a diss at all, but there, there is a need to stay relevant for a lot of these guys that are former NBA players and there's a need to market themselves on social media. And you see it all the time. Players trying to stay in the conversation, start a podcast, be in the game out, 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 look at me. I'm still here. And Hakeem with the self-confidence of somebody that says, I know what I've done. I know the work that I'm doing. I am still giving, but I don't need to brag about it. So I think he he just prefers that. Like he, I will get random texts from people in Houston, like Hakeem's at the game and he's just sitting there watching. And I'm like, yeah, because he's a human being. What do you want? <laughs> like he doesn't like travel with security. You know, it's crazy. He's just a normal guy, and he likes that. He likes the privacy. Mm -hmm.